with the Center for. Thank you, Jill. Okay, as you just heard, the meeting is being recorded, and uh, I'm Linda Kenny with the Center for Health Design, and we are having our affiliate connections call. We used to do these quarterly, but since COVID, we've started doing them every other month. Um, so we'll have a couple of introductory comments, and then we're so excited and honored to have Terry Zabrowski and Rebecca Sanders with us today. Uh, they will be sharing their EDAC advocate project as well as a Touchstone award-winning project. It will be a, a description of a pre- and post-occupancy um, study of the NICU environment. So thank you so much, Terry and Rebecca, for being with us. We're, we're going to begin today with um, a poll, just a quick poll. And one of our goals in 2021, um, you know, we're hoping that life gets back to normal a little bit at least. And we really want to look for your feedback so that we can really be focusing on the areas that, uh, particularly with you know, your memberships that are really most valuable to you. So you will see in the upcoming newsletters as well as the, um, the presentations that we do, we'll be asking you, you know, what's most important to you? So if everyone could take just a minute right now and uh, answer the poll that you see up on your screen. Just one quick question, and we'll keep collecting this information, and, and that will help guide us uh, in 2021. And thank you all so much for being part of the Center for Health Design and really for being part of the community and contributing. We, we really value the relationship and um, are just so, feel so privileged to be able to work with all of you. And let's see. We have a few more folks to answer the poll. I love the instant gratification of polls. I guess we can, did you get that information, um, Jill? Should we shut it down? I did, thank you. Okay, we can close that then. Oh, did I share the results? Ah, oh, it didn't share. Okay, sorry folks. Jill, do you wanna tell us what the number one and two? It says I'm, I'm sharing it, but the number one was stay up to date on the latest design research and second was education and CEUs. Nice, all right, thank you everybody. So we have about an hour together today and we have a jam packed awesome agenda. So we're gonna to try to get to it. Um, the call is being recorded. So we, you will be able to have access to the recording, um, particularly if there are some of your colleagues that weren't able to join us today, you can let them know that they have access to the recording. And we wanna ask that everyone stay on mute. Uh, you know, we're all living our lives on Zoom right now and I see that everybody already knows the drill. It looks like everyone's already on mute. So thank you for that. And then of course, use the chat box to ask any questions. Um, Jill Glazier and I will be running the call and I know Jill and both, both Jill and I will be monitoring that chat box in case you have questions for Terry or Rebecca as we go through. This is where, if you are wondering how do I get access to these recordings, where are they, um, where do they live on the website? It's on the affiliate members only page. So you go to, uh, from the home page, you go to about our members. And then in the right hand box here, there's an affiliate members only page, which is such a cool page because it gives you a list of all your benefits and quick links to every single one of your benefits. Um, so we always try to encourage people to use that. Okay, without further ado, let's introduce our awesome speakers today. Zabrowski is an evidence-based design researcher at HGA, where she focuses on the intersection of user experience and human interaction within healthcare environments. She began her career as a registered nurse before completing a PhD in interior design. She frequently presents her design and research studies at academic care conferences and has been published and heard in other leading industry design journals. She also has a doctor of philosophy in interior design from University of Minnesota. Thanks, Terry. And then Rebecca Sanders. Rebecca 
specializes in healthcare architecture, medical planning, and programming. She leads team processes with healthcare owners, user groups, and designers to analyze workflow, processes, and programming needs to plan operationally efficient facilities. She has spoken at national conferences and has written articles for industry journals. She has a Bachelor of Science in Architectural Studies from University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and a Master of Architecture specializing in Architecture and Health from Clemson. Thank you, Rebecca. So we're so glad to have you both here today. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Terry. Thanks. I'm going to just quickly share my screen. And it's great to have all of you here today and to be here with you. Just going to quickly figure out which screen this is actually on because I have about 25 of them opened. Ah. Okay, here we go. We're getting close. So while yeah. Terry pulls it up, we can give a very quick overview um, of where you may find more information about the presentation. We have presented it at other um, conferences in different formats, and we look forward to someday also publishing uh, some articles on it. Oh, there we um, go. And there's some great information um, you can find on University of Kentucky's website also about the NICU. Thanks for covering for me there, Rebecca. Whew, a little nervous there, but okay, we got it. All right, today we're gonna share with you a research study that what a privilege to be on, and you'll see why when we talk about the results. We've had to condense this presentation a little bit because it can be quite long. So we're trying to respect everybody's time, but we're going to really talk about the impact of lighting sound and the perception of design on staff of a NICU environment or neonatal intensive care unit environment, both pre-occupancy and post-occupancy at two points in time. Um, so we're really excited to be here. And Rebecca, I'm gonna let you take over for the next little bit. Sure. Thank you, Terry. So just uh, I'll be giving you just a quick introduction as to what the project was and a little bit more about University of Kentucky Healthcare. Um, the NICU project, which also actually included a new entry to their hospital within a hospital of a children's hospital. So that's the image that you're seeing here. But as you all know, uh, any project that happens um, takes a, quite a team. So we wanted to make sure that we gave kudos to the entire team. Um, including, you know, especially the lighting designers and and um, engineers and, and architects uh, across the country. So thank you to all of them. And also um, we worked with um, PCL, a research company that helped do some of the lighting research with us on this also. So the project, as I mentioned, it, um, part of that NICU um, was a new entry to the Kentucky Children's Hospital. So this is, as I said, a hospital within a hospital. The NICU project um, was a big part of that children's hospital, but they also have inpatient beds that are stacked above. And this included some uh, new entry, registration, resource center, and um, really important elevator connection to connect all of the children's pieces within um, Kentucky Children's Hospital. University of Healthcare, um, generally in Lexington, um, Kentucky, is generally a level one trauma center. Um, it has over a thousand beds and a very high CMI index as they are a regional referral center for much of Eastern Kentucky and beyond. The building that you see um, there to the right of the kind of curved entry, that is a new facility of 1.2 million square feet that they've been building out since 2000, um, or designing and building since 2005. The NICU project was uh, a renovation with a little bit of an addition. Um, but mostly kind of tucked in between a lot of existing buildings on the campus. Their existing um, NICU, as you see on the left there, is what you would expect from a NICU that was built um, probably in the 60s, I believe. Um, 66 beds, they had total over three different units, a, a couple of floors, but all open bays, very crowded, lots of people in one space, parents, caregivers, babies, a lot of equipment. Um, their total square foot for those 66 babies was 8,300. 
The new is 45,000 square feet. Um, and we um, have the private single family rooms, no toilets as they um, really did not want to have the opportunity for um, families to have their own toilet to um, do things that weren't always appropriate in a NICU space. So that was why they had a family uh, room without that toilet. But again, 45,000 square feet for 70 private beds, um, a big change from their 66 and 8,300. And Rebecca, if I could just add that some of the early research that we saw, some of the parents said in that older, that existing environment, that they didn't feel comfortable being there because there were so many caregivers around the babies that they felt like they were getting in the way. And so I want you to remember that because we'll talk a little bit more about that as we move forward in the project. Thanks, Terry. As always, we start projects with the overall guiding principles. University of Kentucky Healthcare has been using um, similar guiding principles on a lot of their projects that then are tweaked for the specific needs. This one um, around Kentucky Children's Hospital and NICU. The plan, um, we'll spend a little bit of time on so you get a, a kind of big picture idea, but the um, it's broken up, the 70 beds are broken up into neighborhoods of about 11 to 13 um, beds per neighborhood, and those are the circle ones, and that's what we call a neighborhood. The first question um, will get asked, so I thought I'd just get it out there right now, they do not each have an exterior window. Um, some AHJs and uh, states will require that. University or the state of Commonwealth of Kentucky, um, when we built and designed this, was still under the 2006 FGI. So it was required to have access to natural light. So at the end of each of the neighborhoods, there is that access to natural light, and some also have some skylights. So that um, will be then what you might see on others that are all exterior. This did allow us to fit it into the square foot that we had. Um, but again, we have those um, six neighborhoods of um, 11 to 13 beds. And uh, on the middle of those neighborhoods, so you, the number fives are the staff support so that they were central to the six different neighborhoods. The purples in the middle of the neighborhoods, um, yes, thank you, those there are the staff workspace areas, the medications, clean, soiled, support, and those can connect from one neighborhood to another. They were very concerned about being isolated within their neighborhood, um, and that does allow staff to um, have some interaction between um, those neighborhoods. Um, other things to maybe point out, there is um, a, an infant nutrition center, um, which was a big deal to serve the entire facility, but not, um, so not just the NICU, but it, doesn't, it does serve other floors, so it's a large infant nutrition center, and there was a lot of study on that with others and how that works, as it was a new process for this group. There's so much Why more I could I say. Can just yep. mention the uh, staff break, Rebecca? Yes. So where um, Terry is, uh, has her cursor there by number five, there is a staff break room that actually has a patio, an outdoor patio just for staff. Um, and that is very much well liked. The um, yellow area, you can see at the very bottom, all of that, that is the new entry to the Kentucky Children's Hospital, and that's what connects this area to the rest of the, um, Kentucky Children's, the inpatient beds, and they have an outpatient unit below for um, infusions and procedures. I think we'll move forward as far, as far as time, but we can always come back to that as there may be questions. The design of the space um, was so much fun to work on as they're very proud of the Commonwealth of Kentucky and we really wanted to bring in um, aspects of Kentucky into the design. So each neighborhood has kind of a, a color and a graphic theme that goes throughout that we wanted to make fun but not um, 
not to make it so fun that the parents also don't feel welcome. So it has those bright colors and some of the great graphics, but it's not uh, a too childlike. However, it does bring in again those those Kentucky pieces. This one is the warbler, the um, one of the birds you'll find in Kentucky. We could not use their state bird because that would be the cardinal, and that's their rival in sports. <laughs> so all of those things came into play. Um, but then you would see how that graphic would continue out throughout the neighborhood. This is the um, nurse charting area between two of the single rooms. And you can see how um, the graphics play throughout the facility as well as the color. What a great wayfinding tool for families, I might add. Yes, so um, there was a big concern about how will they find their neighborhood and their room once they leave. And it does help them remember which neighborhood their baby is in um, and even which room because all the graphics are different outside of the rooms. Mm -hmm. This is one of the single family rooms. Mm -hmm. Sorry, and then you can go back. No, you're good. Okay. Yep. What bird is, is that the hummingbird maybe? This is a hummingbird and cone flowers. The so cone also, flowers. Um, I believe the cone flower was the state flower. Ah, beautiful. Thank you, Rebecca. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the research. Um, of course, um, we are a, a, a CHD affiliate organization, HGA company. And so um, we use the EBD process as much as we possibly can infuse it into a project. And for this project, it was actually very easy. Uh, the group, the whole group uh, was so uh, engaged in being able to validate what was going on uh, and help make design decisions using evidence-based design that it was very easy to work with this group, not just our own design team, but the owner and the facilities director that worked with us. So it's a great example. And I, I wanted to just add this slide in. Um, we, we have multiple stories from this project, um, but one of the big stories that we, we don't have time to cover, but we used a lot of survey work and focus groups early on with the patient and family advisory group and the staff mm. to understand the voice of the customer early on to make design decisions. I believe the milk lab that uh, Rebecca was talking about earlier was one of those results was that there was such a strong desire to have that in, in placed in the facility that it, uh, it actually became a reality. So we used um, research methods throughout the process. So I just wanted to highlight this. Um, but this study that we're going to talk about today is really a, a great example of a pre-occupancy and a post-occupancy uh, study that we did that was uh, really interdisciplinary. So, and it took place at three points in time. So the first phase was of the existing space. Um, we did an online questionnaire, lighting measures. We'll talk about that because um, they did institute um, uh, cycled lighting in the project and I'll, I'll show you some examples of what that exactly is. And we had our lighting researcher to help us look at how we can evaluate that and I'll represent some of the slides that she has. And then we did acoustical measures and I'll talk about that in a few minutes when we get to the results. So we sort of had this multiple method approach that we could really start to measure the impact now of acoustics or sound and noise, lighting, and also the design features on uh, the staff, really. We tried to engage the, the parents, but it's such a stressful time for them. We just could not get enough uh, parent responses to make, um, to, to really um, be able to evaluate them quantitatively, but we do have some qualitative, as I mentioned earlier, responses from them. And then we were really curious, what about what happens like a year after we first did this? What will the results be like? What will they change? Um, as a researcher, there's a few times when I'm very stressed out about the results, but that was one of them because you're not really sure. We haven't done a lot of what we call longitudinal studies in this area, so it was a little bit of a stress for me. But I was very happy with the results in the end. So this, what this tells you is when we evaluate the demographic data from this, we're able to say, this looks like a really good match sample across the, the um, three points in time when we did the study. And why that's important is because 
if we saw a wide range in terms of either roles like in the upper right or in terms of how many years people had been working there, then we might see some skewedness in the data, but we can really say with some confidence that this is a pretty good matched sample just based on the numbers alone of the people who responded, but also the characteristics of who they were. So we feel really confident that we really did capture the impact. So again, this is kind of a pared down presentation. You know, we can actually talk for probably a few hours about this, but we knew that well, we just don't all have that amount of time. So we have pared it down to some key slides, um, but feel free to ask questions at the end. And um, we'd happy to share other information with you if you're interested. So we did do acoustic studies, but I think of all the acoustic studies that we did, which I'll show you some of the decibel levels in a minute, I think this question was probably one of the best ones and sort of captures everything together. We asked, um, we asked people in the unit, do you ever have trouble understanding comments um, from others um, because of noise? So does noise get in the way of your ability to work hear, communicate with other people. And in the pre-occupancy stage, you can see we had an 86% yes. And in the post-occupancy stage, we have an 84 to 87% no. So it almost flipped completely. So when you think about that just as a result, and you think about uh, when you're moving to private rooms um, in a NICU environment, uh, this is one of the reasons why you wanna do it because you really wanna decrease a lot of that noise, um, that background noise, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, because people are not just sleeping in this environment and resting and growing as babies are, but they're also working and making critical decisions. So um, we did this, we did decibel levels. Uh, we have high level uh, audiometers. Um, we, uh, we record sound levels for about two weeks at a time in one spot. We did them in huddle spaces, corridors, and patient and family rooms. This is the one I'm gonna share with you today, the results of. Um, and so um, what, what, what it does collect is um, uh, decibel levels only. It does not uh, collect voices or record conversations at all. This tool just really records decibel levels. And so um, what you're seeing uh, in, um, in the uh, upper graph is the pre or the existing state and the beige bar is where the FGA standards are um, in terms of where we want the noise level or the sound level to be. And you can see that it's very much above, but if you remember that picture, of uh, the pod layout, you can easily see why that would be there. Now, the blue bar is the, um, uh, is that called the LA equivalent? And that is the sound level equivalent averaged um, over time. And the red bar is the uh, average of the high peaks of sound that we hear. Now, just for context, if you don't know, 80 decibel levels, uh, is the sound of some of someone standing, if you're standing at the side of a highway and a semi goes by you, that's about that, that's about 80 decibels on average. Now, the difference is, is that the blue line is what's really affecting you over time. Um, you have to have, in order to have ear damage, like you might've all had at concerts if you went to before we had earplugs, I was one of, of that era. Um, you had to be like having sustained high levels of decibel levels in order for it to damage your ear if you are, uh, um, you know, an adult uh, it, um, person. Now, a baby is very different, right? So now we look at the, we look at the um, new spaces and we look at the private rooms and we can still see those decibel levels just above that bar. Now, that is not a good thing, but honestly, um, of the three other studies that have been done uh, recording decibel levels uh, accurately in, an, in a neonatal intensive care, none of them have been able to meet the FGI standards. They all have been above. And actually the reason is not the babies or the parents or the staff. I'm sure many of you can imagine what it is. It's the equipment. So even if we take the baby out of the room and everybody else, and we just run the equipment, that's the level of sound. Now, why is that important? Well, I'm gonna tell you, of course, 
It's important because what we know about premature babies, so when a baby's born before their term, there's a period of developmental period that they have to catch up to in order to just be that newborn baby that would have been normally between 38 and 40 weeks born. When that baby is born early, they have some developmental tasks and, and uh, physical tasks to catch up with. One of them is affected by what they hear, believe it or not, and they have done studies in the, in the uh, neonatal world where the sound of the mother's voice uh, actually helps the brain develop. So we have a bit of a conundrum here when we have very high decibel levels and baby in that little isolate or incubator can't actually hear mother's voice uh, might mean that they're not able to actually um, fully develop the aspects of the brain. And this realizes itself, believe it or not, in reading levels later on. Now, it doesn't mean that this is all a lost cause. Mother leans forward, talks to the baby, they bring the baby out, they do kangaroo care. Those are things that help compensate for that. But overall, it is an industry, we have a lot to learn and we have a lot to learn in terms of product development. Okay, that was my big, big speech. I'm gonna go much faster now, no one sweat, we're good. So let me share with you some of the design results. Um, and I only have selected a few here to discuss with you because we do have quite a few more. And as Rebecca said, we're trying to write this up as an article. Um, and who knew that we'd all be so busy during this COVID time, but we really are. <laughs> so, um, but what we're seeing here is we asked what type of nurse workstation or what type of, pardon me, not what type of workstation do you work at most often on the NICU? And so you can see this evolution here of the pre-occupancy charting area inside the patient room, remember that that meant that six bed pod. So that's where everybody pretty much was charting that was doing direct care. Physicians could step out, other people could step out, but nurses and everybody was sort of in that area, right, making, uh, it, clogging up the little space that they were in. When we go to the six months post-occupancy, we start to see them, everybody sort of moving to that corridor charting. And when we get to the 12th month, we really see some evolution and we see much more charting going on um, at the central nurses station and, and in closed shared offices than are happening in all of the other spaces. Now we didn't record that by shift type. So we probably could see some differences if we looked at days, evenings and nights. I do think this is one um, sure. great graphic that shows what the, the importance of when you do a do that post occupancy, you know, at the first six months, it's still new and yeah. things are still being worked out. But at that 12 months, I think people are starting to get into a workflow they um, will probably stick to a little bit longer and it's not quite as new. So, you know, if you do a post occupancy evaluation at six months versus 12 months, the results certainly will be different. Mm -hmm. And if you can do 12 like we did, I think that's really where you can get some good information as you see the, the presentation fold out here. Thanks, Thanks, Rebecca. And I, I just want to remind folks, um, Rebecca is actually answering questions as we go through the slide deck. So if you look in your chat box, you'll be able to see the questions and answers there. Awesome. So feel free to type in a question if you have one. Thank you. I was getting worried about answering all those in the time that we had. So thank you, Rebecca. Again, another slide just to show you how does the overall unit design affect your work performance. You can see uh, the pre-occupancy data on the left, somewhat hinders, hinders and neutral were the biggest categories, all the way over to the 12 month where we start to see somewhat enhances and enhances. We begin to see that neutral pop up again, and it would be very interesting to go back in soon and have another look at that. That's when you can start to deep dive and see have people started to create workarounds, and if so, what are those workarounds? But so far, we're seeing a really high functioning unit. And again, um, we have many more slides of this, but I'm just going to share with you two. One is related to the unit design, so the overall unit. And um, I ran a t-test between the pre-occupancy and the six-month um, data responses, and we found everything to be statistically significant except for level of security and safety. Um, and some of the hints that we saw in some of the data was that perhaps because the units still are, or the neighborhoods, as they might be called, are still um, standalone with a, a corridor coming in front of them, you really can't see who's coming towards you on the unit until they're actually in front of that door. 
So we wondered just based on some comments that we saw whether that was what was driving that level of security and safety. It's better, but it's still not really statistically significant, but absolutely everything else was. And we used a five point Likert scale with a neutral in the middle. Um, and then we say patient spaces, um, and um, we can see that everything here actually was statistically significant from the pre-occupancy to the post-occupancy six months data. And I'm going to talk about lighting. Now, this is not my area of expertise, but having worked with uh, Andrea Wilkerson, who was the researcher uh, and helped inform on this, I've learned a little bit from her. So um, one of the things that, uh, that they, the team felt that was really important to do um, uh, because they didn't have windows was to create a sense of a cycle of the day, of the 24-hour day. So they, call, they created a system, I think it's a GE system that they used that created a cycled lighting component. And I'll show you a little bit about what that looks like. So at dawn, we go from complete darkness to dawn, which is 7 a.m. And so I believe for the next uh, half an hour to an hour, they have this sort of wake up light to a daylight, which is much brighter. You can see the Calvins and the Luxes uh, that, I've, that I've noted here. We go to again at 7 p.m., we have dusk. So we have again, starting to get ready for bed. The, um, uh, and, and in this way, uh, lighting was used not so much for the circadian entra entrainment, but it was really used as cueing behavior for day to night. Because you can easily, as you know, if you've been in a hospital without windows or minimal windows, really lose your sense of time over the day. Um, now, they did have an exam light, so, and, and they could interrupt, the staff could interrupt this, the cycled lighting at any time, so if no one did anything else, it would just run through its cycle. We'll show you in a minute what that looked like. But they could um, actually turn the light on, uh, and that would turn on an exam light. Something happened to the baby, doctor walks in, wants to do some sort of exam or procedure, they can completely override that cycled lighting and turn the exam light on and then off, which was dark. Now in the perfect world or in our ideal world in which we like to think that we live, this is what should happen. <laughs> it should be off from, um, what was it? 8 a.m. till um, 6.30 or till seven in the morning. We have dusk, then we have the daylight hours, then we have, uh, sorry, we have dawn, then we have daylight hours, then we have dusk, and then it turns off again. Um, but um, GE actually has been sending all of the data to Andrea Wilkerson, the lighting researcher, and she actually has been uh, um, collecting all the data for every single room, 70 rooms, uh, every day, every time of day, and this is actually what she found happening. And so uh, on the surface of things, what it looks like is approximately 40 to 50 percent of the time the staff is doing a manual off. So the staff was turning the light, the cycled lighting off, leaving it off and just using the exam lights and not, not resetting it at the end of the day. Uh, and so when Andrea started to see this data coming in, she started to realize that something was wrong because 40 to 50% of the time with the lights being shut off from the, the way it was intended to be, the tunable lighting, uh, there's something wrong with the system or there's something wrong with the way it was being used. So actually Andrea went down there uh, to Kentucky to, to, to discuss this with the staff and she found that many of them were not educated on the lighting itself at all. So the staff didn't even know that there was this intention to have this um, cycled lighting. So she did education sessions while she was down there. Uh, and one of the most interesting things she found in a, in a focus group was, um, well, uh, two things actually, but one of the most interesting things was that the mothers who took their babies home after this, um, but came in for other things, other kinds of programs, told the nurses that their babies, they felt like integrated much better to a day to night cycle, they thought because of this. The other thing the nurses told Andrea was that because of especially the dusk, setting at night that they had very 
uh, they, the nurses always felt like they had to tell the families when to sort of wrap up, get ready for bed so that the babies could, you know, they could have more of a natural cycle with the babies, the ones that were, were more or were getting better. And the nurses told Andrea that the ones that did understand what the controlled lighting was for, the cycled lighting was for, were actually the, um, were uh, less, had less negative interaction with the parents. In other words, not having to mother the parents and tell them, oh, it's time, you know, to get ready for bed. Um, but the lighting actually started to cue them to get ready for bed. So she thought it, that the staff really loved that component of it. Um, now, um, Andrea has been doing some lighting studies for a while, and so we included some, um, some of her uh, questions in our survey that we did. And so I just want to point out that she actually had a five-point scale that was a bit different than ours. So she had a poor neutral, fair, good, excellent, um, whereas our neutral was more in the middle. Um, but overall, you can see that post-occupancy that there is, um, you know, really uh, uh, at least a one-point advantage in almost all of the categories here in terms of uh, the rating, the light for the specific areas uh, in the room and in the unit. Um, and then uh, again, whether the light uh, has ability to hinder uh, or enable um, your performance of your professional duties, again, we see um, you know, much more positive uh, impact of the lighting um, in the post-occupancy evaluation. And again, we see a lot of parallels in the six month and 12 month, which is really nice to see because we want to make sure um, that we're, that it's sustaining itself as Rebecca said. And look at that light level in the work area. Oh. Um, I mean, just to remind everybody next, picture there on the left what was existing is that you know they were they were working and charting where the babies were sleeping and so it was always very dark and quiet as it should be but now they actually had a place just outside to do their work so I think that um, you know where they had options of where to do their work in the new layout. Would you like to finish up Rebecca with some of our lessons learned? So these lessons learn um, kind of go the gamut from the, the design to how we did the research. And so we'll go, we broke it up into things around kind of people and how um, we put the research together. One of the things that I wanted to point out is that there's so much heck, op, uh, opportunity to do research on this project. There's so many things we wanted to do. And um, we had some conversations to talk with both the providers, clinicians, facilities, and our, our own teams to talk about what it is that we do want to do research on. And it was a huge list. And um, what was completed what you just saw was because we kind of took charge of it and ran with it. There's a lot of other ones that it would have been great if um, we actually like gave to a clinician and said, let's run with this one too, and we'll help you with it. But they obviously have a different day job, but there's, um, I think in hindsight, maybe uh, assign people to different uh, research activities, but we were glad we got this one done. Um, I think under process, an important one I wanted to point out is the IRB process. As Terry mentioned, we did have a lot of voice of the customer um, conversations and um, focus groups and surveys at the very beginning of the project before we started to draw anything. Mm -hmm. And um, we wanted to get going on that and didn't have time to do a whole IRB process before that. So really can't use a lot of those results. It helped of course with our understanding of the needs for the project and it improved the project of course, but harder to report it out in a process without that IRB. And for those of you um, who don't know as much about the IRB, Terry is your person to ask. <laughs> I just have to say that. Thank you, Terry. Just give me a call. Right. <laughs> yes. Um, some of the kind of the design lessons learned. The um, you know as Terry mentioned the uh, under acoustic data the design for reduced noise needs industry attention. We all know about alarm mm -hmm. fatigue and alarm noise, and um, this would be one area that would um, could really use some work on that as we've heard. Um, the huddle space. So um, if we have time, I'd love to go back to the um, 
the plan and talk more about the project itself, but I really wanted to make sure we had time to talk about the research. But there are some huddle spaces within those neighborhoods that do give um, great space for um, rounding to happen, for conversations to happen out, you know, not inside the room or right outside of the room. Um, they have noticed that where the unit clerks are in some of those neighborhood huddles, that's where it gets really noisy and active. And we didn't plan on having just one for a unit clerk or having this particular place for the unit clerk that they were going to be in those huddles and something we may want to think about um, next time on that. Um, we talked about the break room. I think the other thing real quick before we open it up for questions is um, the penguin refrigerators. Again, not tied necessarily to acoustics and lighting, but with the single family room, that was a, um, and we did a lot of tours at the beginning, that um, those penguin refrigerators that hold um, the formula or breast milk in the rooms are great for um, the families and the, and, um, the caregivers. However, they do create a lot of um, a lot of maintenance um, and operational issues that just need to be really considered. I know they've struggled a lot with getting them to be monitored at the right temperature um, and having them work just perfectly. And those are obviously tied in with the overall infant nutrition center mm -hmm. um, conversation, but just something to be aware of. So we discovered a lot of things and some of the um, research next steps that we would encourage all of you to think about on your next project, should you be so lucky to be doing another or doing a NICU in the future, is what are the outcomes of some of the things like kangaroo care, breastfeeding, enabling breastfeeding in private rooms, so that enables a process that can continue that, um, that they have a, actually quite a bit of data on uh, overall as a nation on breastfeeding and breastfeeding outcomes, length of stay for mothers and babies, staff retention, and then family time in the room. I want to also mention and just uh, have you, um, if you could, Rebecca, tell us, we did actually contact the group um, to see what the impact of um, COVID was on their unit, and maybe you could just give a quick update. So they've actually have um, been, I wouldn't say lucky because it's because a lot of their process and education, but they've had only a few um, babies who are COVID, who have been COVID positive, and they have been um, infected through family members. They were not um, born with the infection, and their staff, and I forget the exact number, very low. They've had, um, out of 250 staff, I think, Five is that right, mm -hmm. Terry? Do you remember yeah, that number? Very low. Five were infected, have um, been infected with COVID. They, you know, they have changed some of their processes around, um, you know, the, in the family lounge area that they can store food there, but they can't eat there. They have to stay in the rooms, um, and they, you know, certainly check family members in before they come in. But um, I, they still allow um, both caregivers, uh, all parents, um, to visit. So they haven't had to restrict that, but not a larger extended family visit. Um, so they've done really well with um, maintaining their, their um, safe environment. And I see there's been a lot more questions. Lynn, I'll let Lynn or Jill, if you want to uh, help. I didn't get to all of these last ones. <laughs> So I think where we left off, thank you both so much. What, what a wonderful project. Um, I, I actually had my own question from the staff, and maybe you answered this and I missed it, but from the staff's perspective, um, what did you find or what did they tell you was most impactful? You know, was it having those work areas? Was it having access to the outdoors? Did, they, did there seem to be kind of a shining star in there of all the changes that were made? I don't know that we asked that specific question, Terry. We've only heard some anecdotal. I don't, if you want to add some of that in. Well, some of what we heard in the open-ended questions uh, too would lead me to suggest that it's the private rooms themselves. So yeah. it's the ability to, um, to concentrate on one baby and one family at a time. The education component, people don't, um, not, not people, but it, it's hard to understand how much education actually has to go on in the neonatal intensive care unit before baby can go home or baby can move on. And in order to have that, that private environment for them is so meaningful because they have the ability then to do that job. 
and uh, do it to the best of their abilities and not be encumbered by the, all of the noises of the other babies and families and crises that are going on uh, with the other babies. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's probably their top one that we heard. I think the biggest mm -hmm. surprise that I've heard from them, um, obviously staff was very concerned that they're used to just turning around and saying, hey, Jill, can you please help me over here? Um, but they knew that they were spreading out and they weren't going to have that um, same connection with staff. Um, and they were very concerned. But I think um, a surprise, you know, with the neighborhood and those neighborhoods have like 12 foot wide corridors for the most part. And some of that was dictated by columns, but worked out really well so that it allows for almost that whole corridor to feel like it's a one big team workspace. And you have, you know, a desk that you work in, you know, if you're doing your charting in one area, Area. The nurses aren't that far, and of, clearly they've added some communication techniques um, to, with technology to be able to communicate, but they didn't feel as isolated as they thought they would. That's, that's excellent. I can see where that would be a concern. Uh, so we have time for about two more questions, and then I'm going to share some resources. Uh, did the nursing equipment management needs change at all pre versus post occupancy? I would say I don't know the answer to that. Um, I don't think, I, I don't recall that being um, brought out in any of the data that we saw, um, other than more of it, maybe. Yeah, I <laughs> because mean, now you have private rooms, so you need, you know, everything much more. And I don't know, um, Rebecca, if you might have some insight on that, too. Yeah, I don't know, Sean, if you're asking more, you know, about, the, as I mentioned, the communication techniques. So oh. they are using now a lot different um, technology for communication. Uh, I don't remember if it's uh, which system they ended up going with, but that it was a big change from pre to post. Um, and then having the um, the telemetry type monitors, they can pull up any baby within their neighborhood that so they don't, if they're not assigned the baby that's right next to them, that they might have one few rows down, they can still look at that baby's monitors right where they're charting, no matter where they're charting. So there was some of, of that technology that changed from pre to post. I'm not sure if that answered your question, but those were some of the technology and equipment changes. Thank you, Rebecca. And then we have a question from Karen. Did they still use blankets to shield the baby from room light? They, um, well, I haven't been there every day to see, <laughs> but they were educated to not, that with the lighting systems as they were, that they should not be using those um, blankets to shield baby unless, you know, there's some really sick babies and who are very, um, very much, uh, still still needing to have that shield, which are, I think, after a certain amount of weeks, they should not need that baby blanket anymore. But that was a big education piece from day one that they um, should not be using those unless they had to. Okay. Can I just and then our final question. Oh, 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 sorry. Sure. I was just going to say that's a great example yeah. of um, creating an environment that really understands how people, place, and process come together. Like the need yeah. for those baby blankets, not needed for those baby blankets at certain developmental stages. But really, that just really, really speaks to that, that we really have to, as designers, sort of get to that sweet spot and understand that clearly. Thank you, Terry. And then our final question uh, from Shahani. Did the expansion occur where the existing NICU was? And if so, what precautions were taken to shield the noise of construction from the existing NICU? It was not uh, um, in the existing location. It was in a, a new location within the facility. It was an old kitchen, actually. Um, oh. And uh, I forget what the other... So funny how we forget those things. Um, what, what else the renovation took over? But it was a lot of the area and then some addition but there were a lot of other acoustical precautions taken in the design as far as you know the new mechanical unit and isolating that and a fan went through a shaft near uh, through this um, locate the new location and making sure that was isolated so there was a lot of other precautions um, going forward not necessarily during construction 
Thank you, Rebecca. And I just want to remind everyone that this session is being recorded and you can access it on the members only page. Um, and there was one additional comment that I think it was Inga that made this comment that, you know, we, we are so careful about creating a quiet space during the design process and then all these noisy machines come into the space and kind of put the kibosh on that. So, um, yes. We, we feel that pain, Inga. I, I think everyone can relate to that. Okay, so Rebecca and Terry, thank you so much uh, for sharing that and congratulations on an amazing project. Um, I think, you know, maybe the good and the bad thing about research is you learn some things and you discover lots of new questions. <laughs> and it sounds like that was the case here. So we're, we'll be really excited to, uh, to you know, follow your journey uh, as you continue to do more research in this area. Um, so I just wanted to take a few extra minutes to share with everyone that the center is doing something kind of unique and special. You know, like everyone, we've kind of had to do this pivot this year and we've, uh, we're spending so much time remote and we wanted, we're, we've been looking for ways to still have that feeling of connection. And so these calls help us to do that. Uh, but we have this Better Days celebration coming up. We didn't all get together. We didn't get to gather at the Healthcare Design Conference this year or at any of our events. So this is an opportunity for folks to gather and we'll be uh, recognizing and appreciating all the silver linings, right? Um, you know, things like who, who could have imagined that telemedicine would be so prevalent and, you know, COVID created that situation for us uh, as a society. And there are certainly a lot of benefits to that. I like my living room as my waiting room for my doctor's appointment far more than I like sitting uh, you know, in a doctor's office. And I feel like they stay on time. So if you put this on your calendar, save the date, Thursday, January 28th at 1 p.m. Uh, Pacific time, we're gonna have some prizes and entertainment and discussion and lots of opportunities for networking. Uh, we Perhaps you've experienced with us some of the events we do where we uh, break out into Zoom rooms and either ask some interesting questions or have some interesting discussions and just have an opportunity to be that are part of the Center for Health Designs community. So please do join us for that. Uh, there'll also be an exciting online auction with my gosh, when I saw the list of auction items, it's like the list I would want to write to Santa. <laughs> it had all these cool electronic items. So that should be a lot of fun too. And then in terms of um, some of our upcoming events, you can always look on the website under the events uh, calendar to see what's coming up. We always post upcoming webinars and events as well as calls for abstract and um, you know, any award submission deadlines. So we have uh, the webinars listed here. I believe the call for abstracts uh, for healthcare design conference next year, the deadline for that is also January 21, if I'm not mistaken. But again, it's under the events page. And then we've added something new to the knowledge repository. So this year we hit over 5,000 citations, which is a uh, huge kudos to our research team. And so this is your opportunity to, you know, really gain insights on all of the research that's being done around the industry, design-based research. And we've, the, the research team has added a couple of new features. Um, we have new key point summaries. If you follow the research in a SNAP newsletter from the research team, that will help keep you up to date on the latest citations that have been added. But they're creating these new slide casts. Uh, which really is like a mini presentation. It gives you a really nice overview uh, of, you know, research piece in just less than five minutes. So those are on the uh, knowledge repository as well. And, um, and then we have, of course, you know, if you want some additional information about the project that was shared here today, it has been published on our site and also published in the EDAC Advocate brochure. So our EDAC Advocate firms are firms where 25% of the staff is committed to maintaining EDAC certification, um, which demonstrates their commitment to the evidence-based design process. And so those firms then publish their advocate projects and we've begun asking them to share those projects 
as part of the um, affiliate connection calls. So that concludes our call for today. Um, I just want to say thank you to everyone. Stay safe and healthy and have a wonderful holiday season. If you have any questions or suggestions, you know, we opened up with a poll of what's most important to you as members, but I always love to hear from you directly as well. So um, I'm going to say that concludes our call for today. Thank you all so much for